we're going to start now, Paula. Early, but there we go. First okay. Of all, um, let me welcome in to our audience here international designer Paula Scher to the Design Breakfast Tea Time audience at London's Design Museum. Hello, Paula. I'm glad to hear that you received your pastry so you'd be able to have tea with us. Um, well, we have a range of audiences with us today. Um, we've got Amanda Tatham and Mike Abrahams of Designers Breakfast lead the audience here, um, which also, I have to say, includes an MA graduate who wrote her dissertation on you, Paula. Ah, we have <laughs> um, We have the Google Plus Hangout on air, streamed live on YouTube, and we also have a Twitter feed with questions coming through. Great. So no tech has been spared. Um, so if I can ask the audience to send through questions for us to ask Paula, that would be great. Okay. You're welcome. Um, I'm going to start with some of the questions, because, um, which I've gathered together prior to this afternoon. Um, Paula, you've done such amazing work. What continues to motivate you? I like to make things. Um, I like to um, design things, invent things, make things and put them out into society. Um, I, I've never gotten tired of it. I'm not interested in the notion of reliving work I've done. I'm more interested in continuing to make it because it's fun. That's simple. Do you, do you ever have this sense of letting your children go off into the world and that's it, you say bye bye to them, or do you keep a sort of guardian watchful eye over them? Well, I have um, I have a certain frustration with identity projects where I um, I think we have it all wrong about how we make them and release them. Um, I think that uh, organizations and um, corporations invest their money in the front end of design, which is essentially the strategy to the creation of a system that winds up as a manual. And I actually think the money should be spent on the other end, because I think all of that stuff doesn't matter unless the execution is right, because that's what the public sees. So I, I have been very frustrated often with how things I've designed have been executed. And it's usually because the problems that created the need to hire design in the first place are still in place after you've done the design. And very often, we don't really correct those problems. Do you think that should be the design team's role, to go into the organization and look at and put try to encourage them to bring design thinking and process thinking through into their company or the world that you're doing the branding for? Oh, well, that's easier said than done. I mean, I think that the, the dirty little secret is everybody can sort of speak a mantra about design thinking and how they should, how something should be or what the brand essence is or how something should feel, but they actually don't know how to make a value judgment about it when they're at the final point of making a decision about what should be made as they're executing in terms of individual campaigns or other um, things that are issued, uh, uh, decisions that may be made on a daily website. Um, ultimately, all those decisions have to be made all the time. They're all the details that make something look terrific or terrible. Do you sort of liken your role of designer to be, and do you like it to be one of challenge? I can't, I can't hear what you're saying. Can you hear me now? Yes, much better. Okay, okay I'll, I'll rephrase the question. Do you like your role of designer to be one of challenge? One of challenge? Challenging organizations, challenging individuals. Um, challenging marketing teams, or do you feel it's much more you go with the flow? Well, I would never say I go with the flow. Um, I'm not really about that, but sometimes the flow's going my way, so then I would. <laughs> um, I think that 
I don't really I don't really think about it that way. I think what inspires me the most and energizes me is seeing an opportunity to improve something. Like I find that incredibly exciting. Um, there are some areas where the market is so terrible that any small thing you do is an improvement. And I enjoy that. And sometimes you work in things that in areas that are very sophisticated and the area is very done very well already and you can't make much of an improvement. And I find that actually debilitating to a degree. So I, I enjoy looking at the opportunity to make something better. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, you're involved with so very many different things, talks, panels, and G City Board. How do you work out what to say yes to or no to? Depends upon when they call. You know, everything is really timing. You know, I don't, I don't have any grand plan. I do, I, I get myself in trouble all the time because people will ask me to do a lecture about a year in advance, and I look at my cal calendar and it's totally empty. And I think, oh, this is fantastic. I'll go, and I'm, I don't have anything going on. And then the year happens, and then all kinds of stuff is already filled in around when I agreed to do a talk that I really can't afford to do at that point. And it's hard, it's hard to get that right. So it just, I, I sometimes get double booked because of it. But I, I, it really is just a, a function of my rather poor planning and sloppiness. I think it's a function of the fact that everybody wants to you to come and talk, <laughs> which is fabulous. I'm getting some feedback here, um, so uh, can we just take it down a bit? Um, just moving to your day to get team at Pentagram, who do you have working with you now in your studio there? Um, um, my team is composed of uh, about six people full time and and three people who are uh, interns and uh, they they can stay for three months or forever depending upon whatever their situation is. Um, they tend to be right out of school and sometimes they grow into design positions and other times they move on and it has nothing to do with anything except for who else is on the team at that given moment. Um, I have a, pro a project manager coordinator who you've met, that's Sarah. I have um, a very sophisticated, um, advanced product designer who manages my environmental work, a name Peter Vronkovich. I have uh, another uh, graphic designer named Courtney Gooch, a woman named Ling Chao Tan, who's also a graphic designer, Kayla Jang, who's a graphic designer, and two other interns. So what sort of range of work is the team involved with the clients today? What sort of things have you got on your desk at the moment? Recently, the work has moved almost 50%, if not more, to the environmental graphics side. Um, the work has always broken up between identities and environments in some capacity. Sometimes the environments are driven by the identities, but I've noticed of late the environmental projects have gotten bigger and more complex. Um, some of it is exceedingly interesting, some of it I'm, it, I'm, I'm still unqualified to do, um, but I find I'm enjoying it a lot. You're, I have to say the picture is doing very strange things, like now you're covered in white, so I don't know what's going on with me. Um, I hope I'm, I'm still bright and clear. But Any questions here, questions, do put your hand up and I'll come and ask you to ask. Uh, does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> um, is it hard to balance the range of projects that you do to ensure a high level of creative consistency? Uh, I try. There are things I don't do. There are things I'm really bad at, and there are projects I don't take on. Like I, I think I'm very, I'm very bad at doing certain types of projects that are closely re related to promotion. Uh, things like uh, real estate identities and brochures I would just be terrible at. So I avoid them. Um, 
I never did well with uh, university-oriented work. I don't, I don't think universities believe me. I don't think they think I'm well-educated enough. So I, I, don't, I don't speak that language very well. I, I, I like to break my work uh, sort of into three groups. One of it is, is, is things that are cultural in nature. And that moves from art museums really into entertainment, theater, and music. Um, because I came out of the music business and I understand that industry very well. And then I do well on uh, very consumer-driven products because they have broad audiences and I, I tend to feel uh, comfortable in those sorts of projects that may have a, um, and may be populist to a degree where, where you're you're actually entertaining the audience and bringing them to you as opposed to something where you're holding the audience at bay. Now there's a great big green thing in front of you. Okay, it went away. I guess I didn't answer the question. I can't hear anything. Still live? Can you still hear us? Now I can hear you. Oh, You're great. weak, though. Okay, I'll shout. Okay. Oh, <laughs> um, just to say, we can't. We can see you on a little screen, but not on a big one. Okay. Uh, is right. the big one back? No, not yet. But <laughs> so you were saying environmental consumer design, and you said there was a third one, and I was so busy looking at the tech, I misheard. I'm really sorry. Um, I I tend to respond well to things that are populist in nature, uh, where where I may be trying to entertain and enlighten an audience as opposed to hold an audience at bay. I'm better being loud than reserved. That's great to hear because so many designers seem to keep cards very close to their chests and be very reserved about what they do. Um, when you work with the client, is, is having the chemistry with, with the client and on the project really important to you or can you just get a big picture of what you want to do and get on with it? I think the chemistry always has to be right. I think that you get the job because the chemistry is right, because you, you, you meet with them and have a conversation with them and you get to understand their organization and what they're about and they get to see how you operate to a degree. So the idea that somehow the project is this neutral thing is, is crazy. It's always a combination of you and the personalities in whatever organization you're working with. And I can feel almost when I walk into a room whether or not I'm going to be embraced by a, an individual group. Um, and sometimes I feel it right away and sometimes I feel uh, sort of a, a form of loathing. <laughs> So it can go either way. So have you ever started on a project and gone, mm, I don't think so, and walked away? Oh, I must have. I, I mean, I, there are projects I've shut Terrorist. down, or I, I, it's it's I'm, it's hard for me to remember one at this particular moment. Um, but I'll, as we talk, maybe a, an experience will come to mind. I do know that I've stopped in the middle of a project and, and uh, said I can't really continue, I don't think that we're working well together and usually what I do is let go of my fee and have them not pay me for whatever phase I was in because I'm so anxious to get rid of them. And I've done it, I've done it upon occasion, I try not to do it too much but it does happen. And then peculiar things happen when you do that. When you fire a client, it's like breaking up with somebody. They want to, They suddenly are in love with you and want to hold on to you for longer so they can punish you more. It's a very funny, <laughs> very funny situation to be in. What? That's got a lot of laughter at this end. <laughs> well, it's true. It just happens. And have you ever? passed a client across to another partner at Pentagram because you thought, hmm, this one's not for me. Does that work? Is that how it works at Pentagram? Well, why would you want somebody else's loser client? <laughs> you know, it's sort oh, of hard. Maybe you, maybe you, I don't know, they got on with them better. <laughs> I, I mean, we do, we do 
pass things about. I mean, we spent this entire morning talking about a particular client in a given industry that we all know to be completely loathsome, and nobody wanted to touch it. You know, I mean, that there are just just pointless, loathsome people out there that you don't want to begin working with. Unless you're a total glutton for punishment and a masochist, I mean, you know, you can you can put up to a certain degree. Um, I mean, have you had projects that have really, really taken you close to the edge, and you've sort of gone, mm, "This." I've had cli I've had clients that have taken me close to the edge. Um, I had I had one client that has to go unnamed for a a not for profit who was so awful, and the project was terrific. But the client was so awful that one member of my team said to me about this woman, she makes me not want to be a graphic designer. I mean, that's about as horrible as you can go, where you don't even want to be in your own profession because, because a client makes you so miserable. That indeed has happened. Oh, that is terrible. <laughs> um, now I've lost my, because I've been laughing so much, I've lost my place on my questions. Um, <laughs> Right. Do you find that the marketing-based numbers imperative still interferes with the creativity and innovation that you might want to bring to a project, or are you now at the stage where, you know, you can move beyond that? It really depends upon how um, the company is using its research information. It has to do with why they want to change and why they want to hire you. I'm finding more and more that mar market research and certain types of numbers are exceedingly useful and are my friend. That based on that kind of information, I can build a basis for helping them improve. So I don't really feel um, threatened by that information unless the information is being used in a political way to defeat something that the group has already determined is good good for them and sometimes that happens and that's more that has less to do with marketing and more to do with the people in the room and how they're using the information we we have a question from one of the members of the audience here hello Paula hi hi my name is Tina hello hello um, would you be willing to share, what do you like to work with? What am I like to work with? Are you difficult? Are you harsh? Are you fair? Are you demanding? Probably all of the above. Are you perfectionist? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I tend to be blunt with a sense of humor. Okay. And I, I, use, I use humor as a way to diffuse uh, unpleasantness, but I am very blunt. Uh, I don't uh, make things pretty. I, I tell my clients the truth. I work very hard with them. Um, a lot of them become friends with me, uh, which I find amazing. I've had uh, relationships that go on for 20 years or more. Uh, I'm still close friends with uh, Susan Avard, who's the global brand manager of City. Uh, I've been working for the Public Theater for 20 years. Um, my relationships are long. Uh, I just redesigned Jazz at Lincoln Center, which I designed 10 years ago. So that that I consider um, some of these people that have hired me to be intimate in a way. I mean, we go through something together. And then sometimes it isn't like that. Sometimes it 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 feels uh, disconnected, and they'd be just as happy to hire somebody else the next time. But I think when the connection works, it really works. And when the connection is right, and the personal relationship is right, then the professional relationship is terrific because you can tell the truth. I mean, I think that it would be irresponsible to work with an organization and and not be as direct with them about what you think as you can because that's why they've hired you otherwise what good are you doing I agree thank you it is just I suppose sometimes people are not in that position and I'm not talking about myself but you know some people are not in a position where they're able to be direct and honest because the client doesn't really want to hear that 
but uh, you know, I, I started doing that when I was very young, when I worked in the music business. Um, I had a, a really terrific uh, training that was unusual because I was 25 and 26 years old and I was senior art director of CBS Records and I was responsible for the output of 150 album covers a year. It was a lot of them, a lot of them. Sometimes we designed them, sometimes the art came in from hypnosis and I was just putting a logo on the back of it. Uh, sometimes I was troubleshooting for another designer. And I learned very, very young that because the recording artists all had contractual cover approval, that you could make what you could get them to do, what you could sell. And I learned then and there that if I could not persuade somebody to do something, I would never be able to make anything I wanted to make. So it became absolutely important that I develop the skills to be able to persuade. And I think most designers who who have difficulty in this area and are are wonderful with craft and uh, even ideas have let this particular skill uh, atrophy. It's absolutely crucial to be able to persuade. Uh, I work with architects a lot and they're much better at it than designers. Um, some of them uh, have so much authority they can persuade people to spend millions and millions and millions of dollars to make something that they might not even need. Uh, it's quite astounding. I think that that designers as a group should be capable of presenting, defending, uh, and promoting their work. Thank you very much. Hi Paula, David here. Hi. Uh, spoke about liking popular culture. Have you, is there an area that you haven't worked in, that you'd like to, preferably an area of guilty pleasure? I've always wanted to uh, work on movie titles and I've never had the opportunity. Um, largely because I, I found the Hollywood system very difficult to muster because of the, the approvals and how long it would take me to develop the level of reputation that would enable me to do that kind of work. But I would like to do that at some point. Thank you. Erica back here again. Um, what's your favorite piece of your own work? Oh, God. <laughs> okay. I, it, I have to say, I get very... I think that I've done things that have mattered in some way at certain points in time. And then I have things that I enjoy doing that probably don't matter. Um, but I think that in general, I'm less interested in what I've already done and much more interested in what I'm about to do. I think that if I'm, the, if I'm working on a project, I always think it can be absolutely terrific and I get really excited about it. Sometimes it's terrific, sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's bad, but whatever happens to it and however it comes out, I'm already on to the next one anyway. So that's sort of how I, I feel about them and I can't help that. Okay, thank you. Um, do you still get faced with very tight budgets to do enormously ambitious projects? Every how day. Do resolve, how do you resolve them? Take us through one, maybe. Well, I do an enormous amount of pro bono work. Uh, probably 25 to some, some years 50 percent can be pro bono. So that you have half or a little more than half of the work paying for the other half of the work. And I can make that work because the fees are very high on one side and, and non-existent on the other. But if I didn't have that pro bono work, I'd still do the same amount of paying work. So it's just accomplishing more work within a given period of time, which I enjoy. So that's sort of how I manage it. That said, I, I do have a piece of advice for the audience that if there is a job that's very low paying, uh, for the public sector, uh, maybe cultural or maybe for government or it may be political. And it's something that you want to do. I would advise you to do it for free as opposed to doing it for the small fee that's offered. And the reason I would advise you to do that is if you do it for the small fee, 
It's a small fee for you, but it seems like a lot of money to that client. So they behave like it's a big fee and you get driven crazy, where if you donate the work for free, you're doing them the favor and you have more power in the situation. And that's just a, just a piece of KG advice I've discovered about low paying work. I think that's a really interesting and very good psychological move. <laughs> um, do you find that clients are more adventurous now as the comp competition is greater or more risk averse due to the recession? And how do you shift those who might be risk averse to be more adventurous? Actually, I think, uh, from my point of view, and some of this may be where I sit right now in reputation and years of experience, I, I've never had a better time being a designer because I find that the client base that comes to me seems to be very design savvy already. Uh, they, they know about things. They're, they're educated. They know what design can do. They understand what they're purchasing, and that, that is exciting. Um, I'm working with a real estate developer with my partner Abbott Miller in Florida on a project where the president of the real estate company is so open to what is possible. And he, it's not that he doesn't have cost considerations, it's that he actually is enjoying purchasing design. And that is amazing. I never had anything like that happen in all these years. Usually you were trying to push somebody to do more and go farther and I'm finding that the clients are actually enjoying getting it and looking for it and I wonder if I'm even pushing far enough now. <laughs> um, can I move to, your, to talk, have a talk about your maps? Um, the wonderful richly colored big word based maps that you do. Uh, you're breaking up again. I think Maybe you have... I wasn't Maybe I wasn't holding the microphone right. But, Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Yes. Um, you, your beautiful, richly colored, big word-based map. What inspired you to start them? Well, there were really a number of things, though I always use C poor Citibank as the example. Um, I had, um, for many years, uh, until the 90s, made things with my hands. I used to make comps with my hands. I, I uh, painted and touched things and in the late 90s everything was done on the computer and I touched nothing. So I felt to a degree like I didn't make anything because I didn't physically touch anything. Then in 1998 uh, I spent almost a year, maybe a year and a half, proving the Citibank logo to Citibank which meant I was making presentations and presentations and changing them and making amendments and changing them and they were subtle little things and showing it this way, that way and the other thing and actually it was really all the same design, I was just simply proving it in a hundred possible ways. And I really had the sense that I wasn't producing anything. Now, now I'm married to Seymour Quast and he is a true artist who works every day. He gets up every, he's 82 years old, he's 17 years older than me, he gets up every morning and he draws. And he, we have a big house in the country and he would go up to the country and paint. And he would be up in his attic studio painting and it would be winter and I didn't have a lot of friends around up there and I really didn't know what to do with myself. And I used to paint these little opinionated maps and I thought to myself, this might be really good big. So I got a big piece of canvas and I push pinned it up to the wall in a bedroom and I started painting the world and I thought I'd put every piece of information in every city in the world on the map and just paint it and see what happened. And it took me about five months to do and I liked it so I started doing it. I had, I had no idea that I would still be doing it 20 years later. I really didn't didn't see that in it. I, I had I began painting them and then a friend of mine who was a was an artist who had, was in a gallery in Chelsea uh, told his gallery about it and and they gave me a show and they began selling. But I had no expectation or design that that would become part of my life. Amanda, 
I'm just going to pass the microphone to Amanda. Uh, breaking up again. The sound. Well, somebody, somebody has tweeted in a question. Okay. It's Control Print from London, which is Control Print News, asking, what is your impression on young designers? On what? What is your impression of young designers? Which young designers? All young designers? young designers? Young people coming wanting to work for you. You know, I, I think they are uh, astounding. I mean, they, they have um, so much knowledge already. Uh, I didn't have that kind of knowledge coming out of school. And of course, they, each year they get technologically more sophisticated. So I worry about the ones that are a couple of years ahead and how they're going to catch up with what the younger ones know how to achieve with, with software. Um, I think that for me, if a student is smart, um, has an appropriate sense of scale and a terrific sense of humor, they're likely to be fabulous. Thank you. If you were coming into the industry today, what skills would you love to have? I don't think I would have come into the industry today. I don't know how to operate a computer. I mean, I can't see ever being able to design on the computer. I can only get my email out. I don't like working equipment. I don't like, I never like taking pictures. My father was a photogrammetric engineer and we grew up with cameras all over the house and I have an anathema to, I never take pictures on my iPhone. I don't, I don't like goofing around with a remote on the television set. I hate all of it. Um, I think I probably would have been a journalist. Do you have a passion for words too? Well, words are good. <laughs> Just going, I just wanted to go back to the paintings. Do you work on them concurrently with the design projects, something, something like Microsoft, for example, or are they? Do I work. Do I work on what? Do you work on your big map paintings concurrently with a big design project such as Microsoft, or do you, are they the sort of relaxed response at the end? Actually, that's exactly how it works. Um, in the course of a year, the kind of work I do at Pentagram is usually, usually this, this nice balance of um, environmental graphics, which are projects that can last from four to ten years because the scale of the projects. Then a, a bunch of short kind of cultural identities that may turn around quickly. And then usually one kind of money maker, you know, one thing that's, that's larger in scale. I don't do a lot of them. We're not Wolf Owens. Our accounts aren't that big. Uh, and that within the balance of those, the painting works very well because the painting is very crafted but moves very slowly uh, against lots of things that are going on for me daily at Pentagram, which are not just uh, overseeing and making designs happen, but it's also meeting with people, uh, dealing with staff, being continually social, so that on um, the weekends when I do the paintings, it's, for, it's, it's totally antisocial. They're opposite lives. They balance each other. Thank you. If you're sort of out and about in New York of a day, what's your current piece of graphics that really makes you smile and you go, yes, they, they cracked that one that someone else did? I really like the uh, Whitney identity when I first saw it that was done by Experimental Jet Set. I have to say, I like it less in execution now and I suspect it's because they're not doing it and, and so that individual components seem less terrific than when I first saw it. And that was really to the first point I made, where I, I'm beginning to think that execution is everything. What piece of work that you've seen did you do you wish you had done? I wish I had done the Whitney identity. <laughs> right. Oh, it was, <laughs> it was that simple. Um, okay, so we were looking at some sort of what sort of books are you reading at the moment? We were going to move on to some sort of different things to put some more flesh on for all of us. 
you know, I stopped reading books. I don't, I don't read like I used to. I, I used to be a, a rather voracious reader. Now I'm a scanner. Um, and I think it comes from uh, reading um, too many things on the internet. Um, I am a political junkie, uh, and I get very obsessed uh, with political stories. For example, during the debt crisis, I was on you know about 15 different sites almost every moment of the day, and couldn't stop myself from from reading about it. And then I'll then I'll go through periods where I'm I'm less interested in it. I read, uh, I still read newspapers. Um, I don't read magazines as much as I used to. I tend to, to, you know, read that stuff online. But that's what I'm reading. I've got a couple of questions coming in. Paula, somebody's asking you, this is called James, is asking you, how do you feel about the amount of online criticism of design today, and how does it affect you, and if it's, when it's your work? Oh, it hurts my feelings. <laughs> when it hurt yours, I mean, it's yeah, so. Mean. I agree with. That. I've read. I've read things both uh, on English blogs, like the Weight Watchers thing, where you sort of labeled it twat or whatever you did with it, and it was just hor horrific. I was worried my client was going to see it. You know, I mean, I just really didn't know what to, what to do about it, and I, there's no way to respond to it. You can't do anything but sort of live through it. I, when the Windows identity launched, I thought I was going to be tarred and feathered walking out of the house. I never experienced anything like that. It was just a torrent of hate. And then it goes away. I don't, I'm not quite sure what drives it. It's kind of a, you know, it's a logo for Christ's sake. You know, it's not like I invaded Iraq. You know, I, I just, it doesn't make any sense to me. On the other hand, I think that it's interesting that people, some people have very wonderfully informed opinions, or sometimes you read something where you think it's quite, quite smart or you gain something from it. Um, but it's, you know, I've, I've saved some of them. I, I printed out a, a blog thread on the, from, I think, brand new from when the New York Philharmonic identity opened uh, when that identity launched, and it was just scathing. And then, of course, it's a completely unexceptional identity. I'm not quite sure what that was about. Do you think the public have an opinion about an identity and that the company who's decided to change its identity should listen to the public or be brave? Oh, you're talking about the public. I'm talking about other designers. I don't think the public cares what the I design. No. Oh, you're talking about the public. I was well, not talking about there, the there, there, are, there have been some things that I think are very detrimental to design. Um, the reality is that any kind of criticism about a new launch is just unreasonable because it really takes a year for you to know whether or not that identity is functioning. And you get, you get used to things very quickly and you change your, your perception of them right away. So if the public is responding, it's likely to be reactionary and we're all losers in that because it means we can't elevate the expectation of what something can be. Um, now there are launches that are mistakes or have ha been handled badly. I mean the, the Tropicana one in the United States always comes to mind where the notion was that you were going to take uh, Tropicana and redesign it as a modernist kind of model. And I don't want to get into a discussion about whether I thought the craft was handled well, but the notion of doing it was, was completely reasonable. And it's possible that with the right kind of promotion and uh, a, an open-minded consumer, something like that could happen and it would begin to elevate the expectation of that marketplace. And the, the reaction was so violent that they pulled back and, and reverted to their old design and I think that's a step backwards. I mean, I don't think that should be our goal. Um, our goal should be a collective community where we come together in support of, of, of design for, with the idea that while we should be critical, we also, we also should not be shooting ourselves in the foot by allowing something that may be a move forward to die prematurely. You're, there's no sound at all. Hi. 
Hello, Paula. Hello. Hello, I'm Katerina. I'm the one that wrote a dissertation about you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have a couple of questions, and the first one is, um, as you are an inspiration for me as a graphic designer and um, as a, a person of all your career, what have you done so far, do you think that you inspire other young designers or, or other designers to be great as you are or to do great works? Well, I would hope so. That's great if I do. You know, you don't go out and get up in the morning and say, okay, I'm up today. I'm going to inspire everybody. I mean, life doesn't really work like that. But if that's true, I'd be delighted. Do you think that when you actually do something, that you might have some impact on the others? Not just in the public, but also the graphic designers and the art world. Uh, I guess I would have, I would, I would say that I've always had two goals. One goal is to raise the expectation of what something could be. And that goes back to when I was in the music business. When I was in the music business, uh, people would say, oh, you can't put illustration on a rock and roll cover because that's a jazz cover. You know, and I would say, well, who made that rule? And the rule was that that was what the expectation was, that rock and roll covers did not have illustration and jazz covers did. I thought that sort of thing was stupid. And I, when, you, when you work for uh, somebody who makes a product and they have some research that says nobody likes green or, or blue doesn't sell or whatever they say, you, you want to be able to, to, to show them that that's an unreasonable expectation, that you can, you can get around that expectation, that virtually anything can be possible if it's done right. And I think that that is our goal. And sometimes we achieve it and sometimes we move the goalpost incrementally. But that's what I want to do as a designer is, is just uh, I was very happy with these the sign system I recently made for the New York City beaches because uh, it was a hybrid. A sign system is usually purely directional and I was capable of persuading the city to put in photographs of the beaches at the point where you entered the beach so you would be seeing where you were and it functioned much more as an emotional signpost than just purely a directional signpost and so that so there the expectation of what a sign system was changed even incrementally and that was that was for me rather thrilling and that that's sort of what you want to have happen where somebody would say oh we don't need to do that on a sign you know i mean i think that would be a typical uh, response to something like that because it would increase uh, the size of the sign, it would increase the amount of money they'd have to s spend to make it, etc. And here, here everybody saw the value in it and I love that. Um, so that's one goal I would have which is like even incrementally to change the expectation. Um, the other thing I think is more uh, something about me that I don't design um, but gets connected to me and that's that's sort of the notion of being a successful uh, relatively well-paid professional woman as a practicing designer which was for a long time quite rare and so it put me in a unique position and that the reason I think that I'm in that position is because I really didn't see any reason why that shouldn't be so. And I think that if I don't think there's no reason that a woman should not be a successful designer, other women can think so too. And maybe that's helpful. Thank you very much. Hello, Paul and Mike Abrahams. Um, I've got lots of questions, uh, but the first one I'm going to ask is, you've done amazing work over the years, and I'm just interested where your ideas come from. Do they just drop out of the sky, or, or do you do anything in particular to generate ideas, um, and, um, and what is your creative process within your team? 
Uh, yeah, that, that's. Uh, I, I've been asked that a lot recently, so I, 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 I've given a lot of thought to it, and and so I'm I'm going to try to explain how I think my thought process works, which is really hard because it's not conscious. I I, I operate very instinctively, um, and I think what has happened is that I absorb a lot. I absorb a lot from experiences. I may be walking down a street in New York City or a street in London or a street in Paris. I may see 50 different things that I've absorbed. Uh, uh, every book I've ever read, every movie I've ever seen, every piece of music I've ever listened to, any quote, any piece of poetry, that's all an experience. That's all stuff I've absorbed. And I've got, I've got that on one half of my brain. And then on my other half of my brain is some brief. It's something that the client has said. We need to do this and this and this, and we have to accomplish these goals, and how do we do that? And essentially, my head is like a slot machine, and there are these two sides that are rolling around. One of them is, is taking specific information with a breach, brief and coupling it with sort of creative references, uh, cultural analogies, things that one might make or use to express something. And they roll around to a dirt, uh, to a degree, sort of like when you put your quarter in, and if you're lucky, the cherries line up and the cash comes out. And that's sort of how I solve problems because the way I intuit it is that I will be in a taxi cab leaving a meeting where I've had a download of a lot of information, and I will be headed someplace else, thinking about something else, and the two things will align, and I'll know what I'm going to do. And I cannot be more specific than that, but that's how it happens. Uh, ideas come at any given moment. They can come when you first wake up in the morning. They can happen to you in the shower. They can happen to you in the middle of a conversation with some, somebody else. There's no way to know at what moment that kicks in. But you can, if you are like that, trust that it will happen. And when it doesn't happen, then you just do something you've already done before because you know how to do it. And sometimes that happens too. And, and what about the ideas that your team come up with? Or are they engaged with you more as uh, people who operate the computers for you? No, they, they, they contribute in that I may transmit an idea to them and the way they understood it had nothing to do with what I thought. So I look at it and I think, oh, I didn't mean that. That's great. That's better than what I thought. And that's the fabulous thing about working with a team, is that the input pretty much comes from me because I have the essential dialogues with the client. Um, but when I sit down with the team and we agree about what we're going to do and we do agree, what comes, comes out is sometimes just totally surprising. So that's the other layer. Um, no one else has got a question. I've got another one if I can ask, please. Um, you said earlier on that your job is to make an improvement um, and it sounds to me that you're very if I say the word reactive I don't mean that in a in a kind of derogatory way that you know projects come in to Pentagram and and you do them you work on them but as a designer as someone who's creative you walk down the street and you see a million things that need fixing that we can improve agree um, do you ever sort of just go out there and do something about it and, and, and you know, I'm sort of thinking in the terms of designer as entrepreneur. Um, we have Not that way. I do, it, I do it in another way um, that's actually very effective. I'm on the design commission in New York City. I'm a New York City commissioner and I go down to City Hall once a week and I actually write guidelines and rule on projects and make people redesign stuff all the time when it's crappy. So, yeah, I'm a big believer in that. That's great. Thank you very much. I think we need one in London. <laughs> uh, you're, you you faded away. You're 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 you're. Um... No, uh, we're just passing the mic between us, so I'll pass okay. it. To the mic. Is that what that is? Yeah. Oh, okay. This is really jerky. Yeah. Seems like 1950s. Hi, Paula. Hi. Um, I'm just interested, I'm always interested, where does confidence come from, especially in, in women? 
uh, and especially women designers and especially women in business. Would you say it's something you've grown up with, you've learned, taken from home? Can you no. No. Is it a New York thing? Mike maybe, thinks it's a New York maybe. Thing. I think it's practice. It's really practice. I mean, I have I have personality attributes because as a young designer and actually as a as a student in art school, you know, I, I, I was in school between 1966 and 1970 in the heart of the Vietnam War, and I was a I was a protester. Um, I was part of a generation that was bratty and thought we could change the world, so that there was some of that uh, kind of rebelliousness that was in my character from the time I was very young. Then I would say in my early days at CBS Records, I was just a total smart ass. And that's a good thing to be because um, people can hate you or put up with it, but you sort of learn to deal with the bruises of that because you've actually put yourself out to a degree and you learn it's not that terrifying. Then when you figure out, and it takes a period of time, how you can actually make something happen based on your lack of, of, of really fear or worry about what somebody else is going to think about it, you realize that's an advantage. But that's a long, that's a long learning process. And I think that it was, I, I was really in my, probably my worst uh, position in my late 30s and early 40s. When I was like a little kid, I could get away with a lot. Uh, as I got to be sort of in a, you know, beginning of grown-up professionalism, which I would say is like 35 to 45, that's where it was really very weak for me because I could not find the right posture. You couldn't be a little cutie smartass anymore. You actually had to develop a different style and how you behaved and I didn't have the kind of crit credibility and power that 50 brings and also I was a woman in business in a marginal business and that was very rough but I there there are things you pick up along the way that help you one of them is figuring out how to ask for money that's and not and think you want think you deserve oh, we, we all want to know how you do that how do you ask for money I used to get up in the morning. In the UK, it works differently to the US, I have a feeling. No, I would practice saying the figure with a straight face. I would look at myself in the mirror and say, uh, that'll be $100,000. I would just look <laughs> at myself in the mirror and say that until it didn't sound ridiculous. You know, yeah, I mean, I know. it was whatever whatever I, I had to, to come to terms with the notion that I would deserve that fee. I was, I was, I would be in situations, and this was, as I said, when I had the business Copel and Share in my 30s and and, and early, I, it was it was mid 30s to to 40, um, and I would people would come, corporations would come to me and buy some work and underpay me, and then not make a decision about it, and then pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for it, going to a bigger firm, and it would always break my heart, um, and it would just show how little respect they had for my time and ability. And um, I realized that I was partially responsible for that in terms of the way I was behaving in relationship to that. That if I didn't value myself, why would somebody value me? And that that's a hard, that's a hard uh, thing to teach yourself. And I, I was also in therapy in that period. I, was, I had a, a therapist uh, from the time I was 32 to 37 that I think was really great about getting me to feel like I could do what I wanted to do. You liberate yourself that way. Yeah, thank you very much. I've got a question that's come in here from Jordan Hemsworth. It says, how important is inspiration in design and should an idea be completely original so work isn't simply regurgitated. Well, there's nothing that's completely original. We all stand on other people's shoulders. Uh, I mean, you can't. You, you would even. It would even be strange. You 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 can push something. Um, you can 
move something to a different level, you can reinterpret something in a new way. But I think it, think the idea of, of complete originality, you might as well shoot yourself in the head. I can design something that I think I've never seen before and find then, you know, a week later, 17 examples of it already existing. Um, I think there are only unique circumstances and moments in time where things come together in the right manner that pushes pu that pushes things forward. Um, there are lots of people that made broad steps, uh, and you can look at, say, a painter like Van Gogh from the period of time he was painting and what existed around him, and he made a giant step forward, but he still stood on other people's shoulders, and that nothing is, as I said, totally original. It's just it's a, another point of view is brought to something that already exists. I have another tweet from Chris, Chris Poots, saying, what advice would you give a young designer working in a large company? Ooh. Um, I, I mean, I have I have a piece of advice for most young designers, um, and I don't know what the large company is, so it's hard it's hard to answer. The most important thing to do in the first, you know, six years of your career is be able to learn and be able to work on things that are going to be good and that you should try to find jobs that put you in that position. Either work for a designer that you think would be a good mentor, or be in a department which is known for doing good work, um, or uh, find a, a recommender that enables you to do good work, but you need to be doing this in the first six years so you develop a portfolio and a body of work that give you some influence. Uh, for your future. If you don't do this and you work purely for the money or you're involved with uh, big projects that go nowhere or uh, committees ruining the work, you'll essentially put yourself in a position of wasting a very important part of your life. Um, so that's my, my big advice to all young designers. Make all your decisions based on the work you're going to produce. If you're working for a big place and you don't have any access to power and you can't make anything happen, and especially if you don't respect the people you work for, get out of there and find something else. When talking about mentors, Paula, did you have a mentor when you were in your 20s? You said that you were working in the record industry. But did you find someone who gave you advice and helped you and supported you and moved you for, moved you forward? Well, I had a woman friend who named Henrietta Kondak, who worked at CBS Records, who was a brilliant designer, and uh, she she worked there and was a role model, but very different. She was she was 15 years older than me and came from another generation, and she was a mom with two kids, and she was working three days a week. Uh, to make extra money in the marriage, and her husband was the artist, and she she was sort of like the breadwinner. Um, but her work was absolutely brilliant, and she didn't understand what a genius she was or how to to promote herself. And I've always uh, I learned as much from seeing her in that role, which was generational, um, and so it was an eye opener. I knew two other women who were really accomplished. There was uh, Bea Feitler, who, who died young, and Ruth Ansel, and they were both magazine art directors, and they were very stylish and, and, and sort of terrific. I didn't know them well, um, but they were role models. The uh, biggest help to me professionally was um, joining the AIGA, uh, going on the board of the AIGA when I was very young. And I, I wanted to leave CBS Records, and I wanted to start my own company. And I met uh, Colin Forbes then. I met uh, Massimo Vignelli. I met um, very successful designers who pointed me in the right direction. And they were very helpful. I think that the three key individuals you choose are all women, rather than a sort of mixture of men and women. Did you find it just easier working with them and listening to them? 
Um, well, I just said I just gave you a list of men who were very helpful, um, and they were all. On, I met them on the board of AIJ, and my husband was was uh, that we were divorced when I had my own uh, business initially. Uh, you know, he was a role model in terms of the way he worked. But the women, uh, Henrietta Kondak, I, I owe a tremendous amount to because she was she was a personal friend, and uh, I would say we we had the kind of friendship which was questioning what our role should be anyway, um, and that 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 was at that particular point of time really important to me. Paula, we've got. Um, a tweet which has come through to say that your number five global tweet um, on Twitter, as you don't have a computer and don't follow Twitter, you probably wouldn't know, but it's something quite big that. We've also got comments coming in in French and Spanish, and we've been followed from many countries around the world. It's exciting. By the way, I do, I do look at Twitter, and I have my computer <laughs> sitting right here. I just don't design on it, that's all. <laughs> We've got a question from Rebecca Duff-Smith asking why have you taught for so long when you've had a successful design career? I like to teach. I don't have any children. Maybe it's my way of, of giving back. Um, I'm just quite interested in, in the relationships you have within Pentagram. Does it, with the other partners, is it as nature of a friendship do you pass informal comments to each other on work, or is there more sort of active competition coming into play in there? I think it's all of the above. Um, Pentagram is a group of friends. Uh, the the partners. I mean, it's a very unusual business structure. Uh, we. Um, you can't apply to be a partner. Um, it's a group of peers, and you're elected in, and it's usually because. Uh, one of us met somebody someplace and thinks they're terrific and thinks they're intelligent and likes their work and would really like to know them better and have dinner with them and that they they do a sort of work that seems like it's synergistic in some way to the group and that when they join they become part of this group and therefore you have the benefit of their intelligence and their influence around you. Um, we don't have offices. Uh, we all sit uh, in very close proximity so we see each other's work and we know what we're working on and we share intelligence. So we may collaborate on jobs that are of a certain scale or we may collaborate across disciplines like I might work with an architect or a product designer but mostly the graphic designers of which are, who seem to be a huge part of the partnership are more um, kibitzers. They're people who walk by and say, oh you're doing that again? And if somebody says that, you know you better pay attention. Um, and we can ask each other, what do you think of this? Or I can't solve this thing. Or, or have you ever been in a situation like this? And, and that's terrific. Does that happen between different Pentagon offices in different countries? Uh, more than you would think, uh, because we travel around uh, a lot. So we get, to, we get to know each other much better than I remember. Um, maybe 10 years ago. I mean, I've been a partner for, for 23 years, and I feel very close to my London partners and, and really love them, uh, and love them individually and as a group. Uh, it's great to be with them. And uh, I feel like that about my New York partners. It's great. Um, we, with, in, if I see my London partners, it's, it's likely to be a couple of times a year, though recently I was just over, so I got to spend more time with them. And we have terrific conversations about what we're working on, what's going on, what we think of other people, really all the sort of things you're asking me we talk about. We're just passing the microphone. Hello, Paula. It's Mike Abrahams again. Um, I'm not sure whether this is the last question, but it may feel like it. Uh, last, yesterday evening, I was listening to the radio, that old-fashioned piece of technology, and um, they were talking about cricket. Um, and they were interviewing uh, a cricketer who's 27 years old called Stuart Broad. Um, and he's really at his prime. They reckon, that, they reckon that cricketers peak between 27 and 35. And the closing question in the interview was, 
they asked him, how would he like to be remembered? Um, can I ask you how you'd like to be remembered? <laughs> oh, forget about it. <laughs> I, don't, you know, I don't... Well, give us a, give us a, I, I can't answer that. I really, I really... Remember me any way you want, if you can remember me at all. Oh. That would be great. We will. Paula, thank you very much indeed. We've thoroughly enjoyed having you here to talk to. Well, so, thank thanks you. for the Design Museum. Thank you. Right. So long. Yeah.